Heart rate variability is simply the uh, measurement of the heartbeat, the interval between one heartbeat and the next. But more important is what it is and what it is a reflection of. It's a reflection of stress. It's a reflection of what we call the autonomic nervous system, which is the part of us um, which, which from the brain, when we're under stress, the brain tells the body how to adapt to that stress. And there's two components that we use every day. There's the, the sympathetic nervous system, which kind of revs us up. Think about pre-race jitters. Think about uh, doing some public speaking uh, or sitting down and meeting your boss. Uh, you know, you're going to have this tension. You're going to have this feeling of stress that um, most people can relate to. And then there's the parasympathetic, which is what we use when we want to relax. It's what we should be using when we're sitting down to a, a dinner. Uh, we're sitting down to eat a meal. It's what turns our intestines on so we can digest and absorb our nutrients from our foods. And the sympathetic and the parasympathetic are part of that autonomic nervous system and they have to maintain a certain balance. There are times when we want to rev up our sympathetic system. We get, we get a little stress before we're going to give a presentation because it's what gives the brain the ability to make a better presentation. Likewise, in a race, if you didn't get excited before your race, you probably aren't going to have a good race. Um, likewise, sitting down to a meal, if we don't turn down the sympathetic nervous system and bring up that relaxation parasympathetic system, then we may not digest our food well. We may develop intestinal problems uh, that may be minor or major. Um, so what heart rate variability does is it, is it gives us a good idea of that balance of the autonomic nervous system. And it's a nice test for athletes to use. These are uh, today available in an app format. Uh, it wasn't that long ago it seemed that uh, to, to measure heart rate variability in an athlete, I would have to send them to a cardiologist where they would do an EKG and um, measure that interval between heartbeats. Um, very, very important test, very old test, very accurate test, along with training heart rate, along with resting heart rate. It's a very valuable assessment guide. I, I think the apps that are out there are really pretty simple. They're, they're inexpensive. Uh, they can be downloaded to your, uh, your smartphone and, uh, it's something that, uh, they're, they're quite user friendly. So, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I would, I would be careful in using only heart rate variability. I think when we want to assess our progress as an athlete, as a runner, uh, I mentioned, um, before about running faster at the same heart rate. Uh, there are many assessment tools that we should use to evaluate ourselves. The more, the more tools we can use to evaluate our progress, the, the more likely we'll be able to pinpoint uh, when a problem is starting to arise. So uh, heart rate variability becomes one of those tools, just like resting heart rate uh, and training heart rate. I think overtraining has finally become uh, something that's discussed on a scientific level as well as a clinical level, which we've done clinically for years. Um, but overtraining has had so many components within it from so many different systems of the body. There are physical components, biochemical components, mental, emotional components, and that um, that diversity sometimes uh, does not lend itself to scientific study or, um, or, or coming to a consensus because in any given person, they can be in a very different situation of overtraining compared to a, a, another person. 
So I think now there's a consensus about it. And the, the, the fact is overtraining is the athlete's biggest enemy. And there are so many ways that they can be overtrained, but it all comes down to one thing. And that, and that is stress. Stress is what overtraining is all about. And it's not the kind of stress we tend to think of when we hear the word stress, which is it's a mental, emotional stress. Stress can also be physical and stress can also be biochemical. So physical stress, for example, would be uh, wearing shoes that don't fit or that are not perfectly comfortable or don't match your, your feet perfectly well. Uh, stress can be uh, the lack of a warm up. Stress can be training too, too much in that anaerobic zone and not enough in the aerobic zone. And anaerobic uh, training is a, a very high stress training, whereas aerobic, aerobic training is a low stress form of training. Um, biochemical stress is another form of stress that can uh, come from diet. It can come from drinking too much uh, caffeine, too much coffee. It can come from, um, and I see this still uh, when I'm out uh, driving, it can come from uh, doing your long runs along the highway where you're inhaling all that toxic gas. Um, and the thing about stress is that it is cumulative. So if we have some bad shoes and we're sitting all day, which is a big stress, if we're not real good with our diet, we're drinking too much caffeine. Uh, if we have a lot of mental, emotional stress from uh, the work we do or from the people we hang around with, that can accumulate and the body responds to that stress, the brain does, and then the body is told how to react via the adrenal glands. Um, and as we as we maintain that stress, if, if, if we don't get rid of enough stresses, then we don't recover from stress and it continues to accumulate. And uh, overtraining is simply the stages of, of stress that was uh, uh, researched 100 years ago um, by someone named Hans Selye, uh, who as, as a medical student showed what happens under stress and he actually showed that the adrenal glands get bigger and that the production of stress hormones increase and all kinds of things happen such as reductions in the immune system uh, reductions in intestinal function because of reduced parasympathetic activity uh, and so on and so forth if we look at the heart rate in the early stages of overtraining, we see the heart rate start to go up because we're stressing the body and the heart rate increases under stress. And if we're training at a certain heart rate, it forces us to slow down. That's why the MAF test will raise a red flag when all of a sudden you're starting to run slower now at the same heart rate. It's an indication that your stress level has risen to the point where it's affecting your running. And in that early stage of stress, one of the interesting things that happens is that uh, many runners perform a, a personal best. They'll come out of nowhere and have a great race, maybe two if they're lucky. But as stress continues, uh, they will often get injured, they will often get exhausted, and they will never be able to uh, perform as well uh, in the next several races or next season or next year because they've, they've exceeded that um, balance of, of training and recovery and they've induced a, a large amount of stress and they've literally become overtrained now. And so um, what happens is they, they see that great event, that wonderful performance that out of the blue, uh, they perform great and then can't come back to doing that. That's, uh, that's the first stage of, of overtraining. Uh, the second stage is when your heart rate remains high. It even goes up a little more. Now, if you're 
training at that same heart rate, you're, you're now running slower and slower, and that becomes a chronic problem. That's associated typically with physical injuries. Um, and while that's happening, what's going on biochemically is you're, you're burning less fat. So you may start getting to be more fatigued. You may start uh, not sleeping as well. You may start waking up at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. Uh, almost like you have more energy at, at 2 a.m. than all during the day. Um, that's what a lot of people say. Um, you're now in the, well entrenched in that second stage of overtraining. And if that becomes chronic, which can, can take many months or a year or two uh, or longer, um, that's a sad situation. These are the athletes who never come back from injury or burnout or whatever you want to call it. It's all the same thing. It's overtraining. In one person, it may hit them more mentally and they may, they may become depressed. They may have a lack of initiative. They may not really want to race anymore. Uh, they may not want to train anymore. Uh, it may be a physical injury, a knee pain that's severe enough to restrict um, training duration or training on a daily basis. Um, it could be a combination of things. What happens in that late stage of overtraining, the sympathetic system, which has been raging, increasing more and more, just burns out and it just crashes. And now you don't have anything left but the parasympathetic to be active. And now your resting heart rate starts to go down. And a lot of people misinterpret that as meaning well, gee, I'm, you know, I keep trying different things. Maybe what I'm trying now is helping because now my morning heart rate is, you know, seven or eight beats lower. Um, that's what happens in the third stage of overtraining. You are exhausted. Your adrenals are exhausted. You can't even keep up your heart rate to a healthy level. And it's a, it's a very bad situation. So uh, overtraining is a, is a serious thing. There's so many components of it. And um, uh, whether it's some uh, little niggle that people have in their hip after two hours of running, that's a sign of overtraining. Whether it's uh, the inability to run three hours or more without food uh, or, or liquid nutrient, that technically could be a sign of overtraining because you're not burning enough body fat. Um, it, it, it's, it, you know, being aware of all these signs and symptoms is, is the way to prevent overtraining, which is really the, the, the optimal thing to do.